out. It's the small one, and and it is, it is a uh, I guess a a genesis of that style, because I'm sure that at one time it was once stouter than it is now. Uh, it has regressed in OG uh, to the point where it's now in the uh, you know four four and a half percent beer. Uh, a pretty quaffable, enjoyable beer, and they've, you know, they uh, brewers like uh, Guinness and Murphy's and Beamish have perfected the style or or improved the style to uh, give you a nice mouthfeel while it's still being, uh, you know, flavorful and low gravity. So it's it's cheap and it's satisfying. So. That's a that's a win-win for any brewer. Uh, moving over, you know, there's nothing really all that uh, outstanding in these uh, vital statistics. Vital statistics, um, as you can see, uh, ABVs are a little bit similar. Um, you get to the American Stout, and it it's certainly a little bit bigger. <coughs> I usually consider the American stout more like with the big ones. And it probably could have been. <clears throat> okay, my COVID's showing through. <clears throat> Excuse me. So nothing special here that you you know that you can really discern out of these uh, vital statistics. So let's move on. Okay, let's look at the ingredients. And because they're, this thing's a little bit too big to actually be able to see, um, we'll look at two of them at a time. Okay, for a dry stout, it is a combination of roast barley, pale malt, and raw barley. And that raw barley can be in a, a variety of forms. Uh, a lot of us like here as homebrewers like to use flake barley or um, another similar product uh, that's raw, but it's already been gelatinized so that it's easier to use. With regard to the hop character of a dry stout, there is literally no hopping, uh, hop, I guess, flavor aroma to speak of, but there is still a decent amount of bittering just to complement the roasteriness and understand that the as some of these stouts, stouts get more roasty, you need to back off the bittering. Otherwise, you, you end up with an overly uh, drying and uh, bitter perceived beer. So that it's sort of a, you know, uh, a balancing act there. And with, with regard to their malt character, they, they are dry, they're coffee-like. And they may have a bit of uh, burnt uh, uh, flavor to the roastiness. So that's something that is allowable here. Let's look at street sweet stout. It's characterized by having unfermentable dextrins. Uh, most typically, it's uh, got a dose of lactose in there. It does use roasted malts as opposed to roasted barley. And they also can include uh, crystal malts, uh, along with, of course, the pale malt. Uh, just like with the dry stout, there's very little hop expression here. You're looking at uh, just a moderate bittering just to allow uh, a balance. But the balance is always going to be a little bit sweet. In re regard to the malt character, it's coffee and chocolate, and it it could be sweet or uh, all the way to moderately dry, depending upon the the brew. So there isn't a true uh, definition for how how a sweet stout must taste, although it it generally is sweet. Okay, moving on, oatmeal stout. It's made with pale and crystal and roast malts, and most particularly, and it is uh, as shown in its name, it is made with either oats or oat malt. Um, of course, they 
provide that silky or oil, oily mouthfeel, which is part a uh, 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 indicator of the style. <clears throat> the hop character again is medium low to none and just enough bittering to uh, get a proper balance. And you're looking at chocolate and or ch uh, coffee in there. And again, it, it may be sweet or moderately dry in, in how it's presented. And the, of course, through those oat, the oat edition, having that uh, silky or oily mouthfeel is an important characteristic of oatmeal stout. And I threw American stout in here and it's, it, it is quite a bit different. Uh, of course, being Americans, you know, we, we bump everything up. Pale, crystal, roast malts, you, you name it, it, it's likely in there. Uh, often and generally required to use American hops, although it's not necessarily, you, you know, it's going to be those citrusy, resiny varieties that um, you would identify as possibly American um, of course, there are other ones now that have that same character. The bittering level in an American stout can range from low to high. And so can the uh, hop flavor and aroma. Uh, although generally uh, in an American stout, you would want to be able to actually perceive the hop character because that is the signature of the, of the, the style. With regard to malt character, you're looking at low to medium malt sweetness, and it typically has a, a chocolate or caramel uh, flavor to it, but generally not much in the way of uh, burnt components. And, and by the way, uh, with regard to oatmeal stout and sweet stout, uh, burnt roastiness is you know, you can maybe have just a slight amount, but really not supposed to have much. Um, dry stout is really the only one that uh, can allow a, a decent and perceptible amount. Okay, let's look at the impressions from for these various beers. The dry stout, your, your immediate impression is cough. And there can be some slight chocolate notes uh, and that blends or uh, bleeds over into the flavor too. Chocolate with that slight, or coffee with that sweet chocolate flavor. And the mouth feel is medium low to medium full. Uh, I remember I had a, a friend back in Gainesville. He, he used to call uh, Guinness, you know, his liquid steak because of course, so with the Baited blue cans from the raw barley that they use to brew with, um, at least Guinness. Uh, it is a very chewy uh, mouthfeel that, you know, belies the actual gravity of this beer. So that that small four percent beer is, you know, drinking like a six eight percenter. So it's like, wow, I'm getting something here. And Wait, it, are you talking about Guinness? Guinness. The pub draft, not the one in the bottle. The pub draft. That beer's thin and watery. It's still it's still got more body than it should. It's got nothing. <laughs> Medium full is the biggest lie in the BJCP guidelines. Fortunately, I'm drinking this Murphy's, and it does. I gotta agree with Ron. I I I'm kind of surprised I got this Guinness Draft bottle, and I was kind of surprised how much mouthfeel it had, because I expect from a Guinness Draft, I expect a very light beer. Yep. Yeah, there's nothing to them, man. They're they're it's like drinking flavored water, good flavored water, but the mouthfeel and the body on on this Guinness I'm drinking right here, and that I drink all the time, it's thin as hell. The only thing that gives it some body is the, the nitrogen, and that's if you get a little bit of the foam uh, along with your sip. But, boy, there's there's really no body to it. it Homebrewed <laughs> examples always tend to have more body um, than, than Guinness, or Murphy's has a touch more body than Guinness. Definitely so. 
but not a whole lot. Not yeah. a whole lot. Yeah, Bod Boddington's got a uh, quite a quite a bit. Yes, yeah, so I'm looking at this murky can. It says, uh, yeah, four percent alcohol. Yeah, they're tiny, tiny, thin, watery beers, but delicious in my book. But but still, the the inclusion of the raw barley uh, does contribute to beta glucans that help <laughs> that that perception of body and, and improvement uh, there. So. Okay, let's move on to sweet stout. Uh, the aroma has coffee or chocolate notes, often with a creamy sweetness, um, kind of eliciting a you know coffee and cream kind of situation. And of course, that uh, also bleeds into the flavor. And the flavor could be also uh, either sweet, dry, or roasty. So, there again, sweet stout has a lot of leeway in how it actually comes across. This beer is a bigger beer uh, than dry stout, and BJCP says it should be medium full to too full, and it can be silky or oily still, which is you know a little bit of a surprise, but. So what's the oily character coming from? I am not sure. I'm just wondering. Oats. I mean, you would, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's a weird. That's a, what, yeah, that's I a weird description, that man. I I might have transcripted the wrong thing there. No, I don't think so because <clears throat> I hmm. The, yeah, I my, my the favorite description. My favorite description of a of a milk stout is that it's like drinking sweetened espresso. Yes. And, and it really that that's in the BJCP guidelines. I didn't make that up. Someone someone else did, but damn, that 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 describes a good milk stout so well like drinking sweetened espresso. Yeah, yeah I don't think I, don't I know think that Dan's got that uh, left-hand milk stout and that's a nice beer especially when it's on nitro. Yeah, Martin, I don't think there's the word oily. I'm not finding it in. Uh, yeah, I, I must have mistranscribed that as I was yeah. uh, pulling out the tape. Me, uh, hey, I, hey, I, I'm a big white... asshole person. And oily to me, if, if, if I'm getting oily, I'm immediately suspecting the asshole. Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 it, it has to be in the improper place. So and I just want to go on record. Where... Down. Where where is the love for the Irish extras? Not here. That's so I know, I know. All right, I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna leave it at that. But I see, but see, I'm with you. If you, if you're gonna include American stout in this category, then you I think you gotta also put the extra stout. We ha I had to cut draw the line somewhere. Yeah. yeah, it was the wrong. It's the wrong spot. <laughs> Not on record. <laughs> so anyhow, let's we'll move on. That. Okay, oatmeal stout, uh, aroma of mild coffee or uh, coffee and cream. It also may be grainy and nutty because of the oatmeal. And that flavor, of course, uh, comes through uh, similar to the aroma. Medium full to full body, uh, very nice. And I should have had the oily uh, uh, or silky mouthfeel on this one, and uh, not, not on the other one. Sorry about that. So that's oatmeal stout. Now American stout, uh, coffee and or chocolate. Uh, it can have just a very slight burnt note to this, i.e., you know, it, in order to separate it really from a porter, you do have to have a bit of uh, well-roasted uh, notes in all of these stouts in order to differentiate from borders uh, in, in my mind. Uh, the other characteristic aroma that you should find in any American stout are those citrusy resiny hops. And you have a similar flavor profile and you're looking at a medium to full bodied beer uh, with the higher gravity, I think that this one went to 7%, right? I think. 
as I recall. So yes. Pretty, pretty decent uh, beer. Sadly, we do not see as many as we should. Uh, I'm not sure that I've seen Sierra JWP. Nevada. Daredevils, that? Daredevils, JWP. You know, I, I haven't had that in years, and I guess I should. Yeah. I mean, back, back long, long, long time ago, um, we used to get Sierra Nevada stout, which is really what created the category. Exactly. Um, but I have not seen a Sierra Nevada stout in a decade. Or so. I would say, yeah, it could have been, that, yeah, roughly that long. The same yeah. thing for the porter, and I, I love SN Porter, and you just plain can't find it. I'm, I'm yeah, not sure that they one even make it. But, uh, but locally, um, Daredevil's JWP is classified as an American stout. I think it's a really darn good one. I've got this um, uh, Bell's Kalamazoo stout. You might see the bottle there. I just poured it. Uh, very tasty. It said it's got uh, brewer's licorice in it, which I find interesting. But it's um, it's yeah, an American. It's delicious. Yeah, it's an American stout. Not, you know, uh, going going back to the oatmeal stout, a uh, BJCP note here. Don't don't you guys feel like when we're judging oatmeal stouts that we're just oftentimes a little bit on the honor system? as to whether it's actually got oatmeal in it. I, it's like sometimes you're judging these and a, and a judge is like, oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm getting the oatmeal like I should or, you know, what, what, what are you guys' thoughts on that? I, I've always thought you don't all, sometimes you can pick up that grainy character, but. Uh, or, or the mouthfeel. A lot of times you don't you you're just going by the honor system that there's yeah. really oatmeal. Yeah, you, you're usually getting some some character that hints that there's oatmeal in there, but you don't have to have it jumping out like that's not what it's all about is jumping out you smacking around with some oatmeal bars or whatever. Well, I'll stand behind our, our imperfect backside oatmeal stout and truly it's got oatmeal in it, believe me. Um, <laughs> it, it, I, I believe it adds some creaminess to it and, and Ron tomorrow. Um, we can take a, a <laughs> kind of pursue this, but I, I believe the oat adds some body, some some creaminess to it. Yeah, and that's a good beer. That's a that's a, a that's a good example uh, of one that's made locally that that people can get. Sounds good. Well, and and while we're still talking about uh, styles, you know. If you read carefully the dry stout uh, BJCP guidelines, it does mention the Dubliner version and the Cork version. Dublin, of course, is Guinness. Uh, Cork is Beamish and Murphy's are both made in, in Cork, uh, Ireland. And they do have slightly different character. And I can tell you, having toured... Uh, Toward Ireland for for 10, 10 days, I much preferred Murphy's. I think it's one of those things when you're in the South, you got to drink Murphy's or Beamish. Yeah, when because you cannot find those beers uh, in the north or you know uh, mm -hmm. no, north and central part of Ireland. You're well, you're not going to find it. Period. Well, we've never been in Kinsale together, Martin, sitting at the White House drinking right. stout. We have at different points in time. And, and I like that place because you can get all three. And I have, on, on a work dinner, <laughs> ordered three stouts. <laughs> <laughs> They're small. They're small. Why not? There was a small why not. And I was like, I'm just going to, you know, you could like order ahead. Like, you know, you order your courses and order your dessert. I was like, I'm just going to have three stouts. <laughs> I tell you what, uh, to anybody who hasn't been to Ireland, you know, you making the grand tour uh, around the coast of Ireland, that is a an easy and memorable uh, self guided trip. Driving hey, is very scary. hey to uh, to uh, go back to my my uh, slam on the mouthfeel of a dry stout. That, to clarify, there is a um, illusionary perception of some body as yeah. it initially rolls off across the tongue. But as you swallow it, it turns into water. 
Eh. Yeah. So, it, but there is there is a sensation mid palate, and as it's first hitting that sweet part of your tongue, there is a sensation that there's a little bit of body there. Mm-hmm. But in the finish, after you swallow, you you're like, wow, did, did I just drink anything? It's really yeah. thin. So it's really thin in the finish, but there is there is a perception of some body mid palate. And of course, the, the the beauty of Guinness is it's cheap and it it uh, invites you to take yet another swig and buy yet another pint. That's Aren't, the beauty. I have an important I question. Long time. The, que- the question is: Are there? Do we? Is there going to be a picture of you in Ireland in this presentation? No, well, I, I didn't even think about that. Dressed as a leprechaun, maybe. <laughs> <Daniel>. <laughs> <laughs> well, at one oh, time, sorry, I, I was a mute. Sorry, guys. Sorry, I was a mute. At, at one time, <laughs> I did have red hair. No, we have a leprechaun. Where's Lee? <laughs> there he is. I thought that was Santa. <laughs> okay, he's our club leprechaun this month. So, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Ireland and and uh, in particular. Uh, what makes these beers special, and uh, and why they are are unique unto themselves. So Ireland, of course, uh, they did take up uh, porter, just like uh, you know half the world at the time, uh, trying to to brew porter. They created their stout, and dry stout is the signature of Ireland, and and of course, the, the notable. Irish stouts are Beamish, Murphy's, and Guinness. A uh, lot of limestone in in uh, Ireland, kind of like here in in uh, Indiana. But the problem is, uh, in in part of it is that uh, limestone is not the only thing in Ireland, and that actually turns out to make a difference. So there are some areas that are granitic. Uh, and with sandstone. So as you can see from this map, uh, what needs to mute? Yeah, please. So in this map, you can see uh, this Dublin is marked with the red dot right here. And then Cork is down at the south um, right here. Cork is in a, a predominantly sandstone laden area, so no limestone. Um, and then uh, Dublin is is actually sitting in a limestoney area. It, much of central Ireland drains through the Liffey River, right through the center of of Dublin. But but the most interesting thing to note here is that this area right here with the granite, this, these are the Wicklow Mountains and they are very important to the uh, uh, genesis of the, uh, the Dubliner style, a- AKA Guinness. And I'll show you why. So, like I said, uh, groundwater and surface water in Central Island, Ireland is likely to be hard and alkaline. Uh, which is pretty good for making most stouts, but Irish dry stout is not most stouts. Uh, the surface water uh, in Southern Ireland, i.e. I. Cork, uh, is sandstone and it's softer and I shouldn't say non-alkaline, it's, it's low alkalinity. And the same thing applies to that granitic Wicklow mountain area, soft and non-alkaline. Uh, Dublin gets their water supply from a bunch of different places, not only the Liffey River and the Podal River, but also this Grand Canal. And I'll show you why that's important. So here we are with the Wicklow Mountains and Dubliners uh, installed a bunch of dams and you can see the reservoirs in various locations here that they supply a uh, a portion of Dublin, uh, most importantly, it supplies the area on the south bank of the Liffey River uh, where Guinness is. And you can see this Grand Canal and 
in the, you know, code, the ground canal is like the Erie Canal, you know, it's the way things were moved prior to the railroads. And water from Wicklow went and it intersected the Grand Canal and they used that water to then uh, keep the canal full of water. And as a byproduct, uh, they used that water uh, as a water source. And it also seeped into the ground here and Guinness had wells. So, uh, and I've already mentioned all this, so we'll go through it and we don't need to concentrate on that. And yeah. Uh, how far does that Grand Canal go across? Does it go all the way across? No, yeah. it's not all the way, but it does go well into central Ireland. So I, I only showed a, a portion of the Grand Canal uh, in, in that past figure. Well, what was it used for? Uh, for barging. But you're only going to the middle of Ireland? That, that's where well, the agricultural stuff was. Yeah, and you're not uh, going to the middle of Ireland. You're going from the middle to the port, to, to the, the ports, I see. where the stuff could be sold hmm. or consumed. So the, the ag, so the ag product, it was easier to move that in large quantity. Absolutely. I see. So all the Americans about, are like, what are you talking about? It's a small island. You could just like walk across. That's, yeah, kind, sure. of, that's yeah. kind of what I was thinking, but <laughs> okay. I mean, so let's that, talk about Dublin Brewing. Okay, Guinness started at St. James Gate in 1759. They got their water for brewing from uh, shallow wells on that property. And as you may recall from that uh, figure, the map. Uh, Guinness is actually not too terribly far from uh, River Liffey, um, but uh, because of the uh, development of the Grand Canal in 1780, uh, more than likely the water quality in the vicinity of St. James Great Gate Brewery actually became softer and less alkaline. And that will play a, a, a factor in the character of, of what we now perceive as Guinness Dry South. So the Guinness water source was not very alkaline through much of its history. Uh, that's because the Wicklow Mountain Reservoirs uh, supplied uh, that district of Dublin where Guinness was. And as a matter of fact, now Guinness uses RO, uh, a big RO system in order to supplement because they need a consistent water. And because their, their whole beer, uh, the dry stout is based on a, a low alkalinity water like this, it's an easy uh, use of RO technology to, to supplement their water supply uh, because in Dublin, you, your water supply could change uh, at any time. Uh, it act, Dublin and uh, parts of Ireland are actually kind of droughty during the summer. So uh, a big industrial uh, conglomeration like Guinness, they need a consistent water supply uh, with consistent quality. So. RO is what they use now. There's even uh, pictures uh, within their brewery tour showing, you know, hey, this is how we do it. So now let's look at cork. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the area is primarily sandstone. They have a reservoir uh, west of cork uh, up in the uplands and it's fed from River Lee and it is soft and it's a little alkalinity. So it's very similar to what we have in, in off the Wickler uh, uh, reservoirs. So Cork and Dublin have at least somewhat similar uh, water uh, and it's, it's not the hard alkaline water that we would get if we went out to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> to, to Flowing Well Park here in Carmel and, and uh, use that for brewing. So this is what a lot of sources uh, purport is a Dublin water profile. 
120 parts per million calcium, that's damn hard. And this 315 parts bicarbonate, that's really alkaline. But the thing is, this is not what uh, Guinness brews with. So put it out of your mind. It's, it, it, it's helpful, but it's, it's not helpful. Do, do, you think, dry do you think brew. it was what they brewed with at one time? I, or I, where, where did this come from? Well, th this is because there, there are uh, plenty of, uh, you know, water quality analyses uh, for the region. And if you go to the Dublin water supply, you can get uh, uh, water, pro or water quality results for all of their uh, water supply districts. And some of them look just like this. But then yeah, it, it, it's not where the St. James Gate is, though. Exactly. That's the secret. So, like I said, don't do this. <laughs> if you're trying to do uh, an Irish dry stout, this is not the profile. This, however, is Wicklow. The Wicklow Mountain water profile is actually, you know, this, this, these are you know, just a notch or two above RO water. And this is yeah. like one notch above uh, pills in water. You could, you could brew a halfway decent, uh, uh, you know, Pilsner with this. This is probably better Pilsner water than Pilsen. It, it could be, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, what is it? Harp is brewed uh, north of Dublin, uh, I can't remember the now the, the the town, but anyhow, uh, just just the, a little heads up here. So, advice for uh, brewing stouts and porters: um, if you're brewing a dry stout, do that low alkalinity water. Um, if you, you know, the, one of the secrets with Guinness is that they they mash their pale malt and the roast malt. Uh, separately. The pale malt and the uh, raw barley are mashed together. Uh, that roast malt uh, is steeped separately. That's, that create the, the separate steeping of the roast, roast, I should, and that's a wrong word there. That should be roasted barley, not roast malt um, for, a, for a dry stout. That separate steeping process creates what Guinness calls their Guinness flavor extract. And that is a very acidic. I, I think that the pH on that is about 4.5. And they, uh, if, if you'd uh, uh, put that roast malt in with the pale malt and the regular mash, the, the pH uh, would have been too low. The, that low pH tends to make the beer even thinner. So, so Ron, that, that would be even worse. Uh, mashing them separately saves most of the uh, uh, character and body in the pale malt uh, mash wort. Uh, and then they just color it and flavor it with that roast malt at the end. Yeah, Martin, I, I have to say two things. One is, you know, I've never brewed a good uh, dry Irish stout until I use this process. So, you know, yeah, that's, it's like, it's, it's amazing how much closer you can get with this. And then two, you know, going back to the nineties and homebrew digest days, I remember everybody talking about the Guinness extract and theorizing what it was, you know, what it was and what it was for. And I, I think it's like absolutely fantastic contribution you've made to like, you know, bringing this forward and, and talking about it and uh, helping people understand what they're doing and what's going on because it, it, it's like it doesn't, it's so far out of normal brewing processes and techniques that you wouldn't think of it. But once you, you know, like you've explained it here, once you, once you uh, lay it out, it makes a ton of sense and the results, I think, speak for themselves. Yeah, people have yeah. hypothesized that the, uh, the, the uh, Guinness flavor extract was a, a lacto uh, soured yeah. thing. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. As I've already pointed out, 
um, when you put a, ro a roast barley with a uh, almost alkalinity free water, the pH drops. I mean, it becomes acidic and sour yeah. um, with with no extra effort. So, you know, it was it was a surprise to me. And and after I deciphered all this, it was you know it, it made sense. Do you think? Do you think is this the modern way of making it, or do you think historically it, there were it was done differently? Oh, I. You know, and, and regarding the, the lactobacillus infection in the brewery and that old story, well, is that there anything could, to that of the old days? It could have been, but the, so I was reading, uh, I don't remember if it was the BJCP guidelines in for dry stout, but uh, there is, I, I know that in in one of these multiple books here, that I was uh, consulting, uh, you know, the, the modern Guinness Dry Stout really only came about uh, right after World War II. Uh, and the tax, or probably during World War II, because of taxes or whatever. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, and, and then it, it was refined, I believe. I think there was a mention of it. Uh, being more refined in, I believe, the early '60s or thereabouts. Yeah. So, See, all all that all that sounds more realistic. Um, and and this technique of of separate mashes and all that seems much more modern. I I would disagree, Ron. I I bet that's been around for a while because I mean, really? Yeah, because I mean, just like I mean, all these. It's not like people didn't have taste buds 200 years ago. I mean, they're tasting it and they're like, mm, this isn't as good a stout or, you know, porter or stout porter or whatever than those other guys. And like, you know, as, as they sort of understood water chemistry and things, I, I bet this has been around for a long time. It, huh. it might have. I don't know. But anyhow, so. Hey, so Martin, one, yeah. Just, this I was going to ask one other question. There was sure. there back going back to like '90s, you know, with all the theory about lactic and what they were doing. Part of that was they were shipping extract, you know, around the world yeah. to all the yep. other Guinness breweries. And so, is is that same roast malt steep what they were actually shipping, or is that are those things not related? No, I, I think that that's exactly what they were doing because, uh, you know, if you're if you're trying, you know, you can, with a moderate, you know, so, so for instance, Guinness has a brewery uh, over by uh, Heathrow in London, and it's a huge brewery, um, but the, the dry stout out of that brewery is not quite the same as out of Dublin. So, uh, you know, and, and part of it is because as you saw from those water profiles that I, I showed you about London, you know, they have significantly more alkalinity. And I don't doubt for a moment that uh, steeping roast bar roasted barley in a real, you know, nice, clean, almost Pilsen-like water uh, produces a s substantially different flavor than if you had done it uh, in that London water, uh, even if you then still acidified it somehow uh, to get it to the right, you know, pH range like you do in Dublin. So for them to, to do the, the Guinness flavor extract, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it, it seems inefficient on one level that you're shipping the stuff around the world um, but on the other hand, you know, if you're trying to create some consistencies in your beers, although Guinness, isn't there like 18 versions of Guinness on the planet or there was, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> yes. like yes. that gets really adapted to the climate and the brewery and whatever. And I'll, and I'll add on to that. I don't know if anybody has a Guinness canon for a little of them, but I, isn't Guinness one of the ones that's brewed in Canada so it can say imported on it? You know, that was important like in the 90s to be an imported well, beer. You know, Guinness has their brewery in Baltimore now. All right. Yeah, I think I, I, that's why I brought it up because I thought they actually were brewing it in the States now instead of in Canada and they, you know, can't say imported anymore on the 
Kansas. Yeah, I, I think it's right across. It's right on the bay uh, by Fort McHenry. Um, well, across the bay from Fort McHenry. Well, so, I love uh, this bottle of draft I've got says uh, brewed in Ireland by Genson Company at St. James Gate. Yeah, uh, that's just it. When I was at uh, Guinness, they said all of the the dry Irish stout, this small one, that all of this came from Dublin and that only the other stouts are made elsewhere. But every version of this that you drink, they said comes from Dublin. That sounds like some Irish guy who's never been out of Dublin. <laughs> it, it, it says it on, it, he, Charlie just read what it says on his bottle and it says the same on every can I've ever had. And what do you, are you drinking a uh, pub draft, Charlie, or is that something else? He is. Yeah, I've got, this is the, um, uh, yeah, just dra draft stout, it's called. Get us uh, at St. James Gate, Dublin. It's right on the, the first oh, part it? of it. Draft stout, they call it. And the supply but, chain logistics guy, that sounds terribly inefficient. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but but I think it's part of their kind of marketing and folklore and all that. But, but, all, their other, but all their other stouts are made around the world. And um, we, the extra stout in the bottle, we get, that's made in Canada for the U.S. market. And when I was at the Palm Brewery in Mechelen in Belgium, they were they were brewing some version, I assume the extra stout uh, for Europe market. And I saw big totes of the essence of Guinness. Oh, awesome. Yeah. That's a neat, uh, neat fact right there. Yeah. Okay, so, so that previous slide, that's for dry stout brewing. Now let's talk about regular stout brewing. And here's where Indiana and central Ireland shine because, you know, high alkalinity water is great for brewing stouts and porters because uh, that, that helps keep the pH from getting too low and a higher pH actually causes those roast flavors like cough, the coffee and the chocolate and all that to, to soften and round and it makes them much richer. Uh, I also have on the Bruin Water site, uh, uh, I point out the, the Dutch chocolate process, which is exactly the same thing where uh, the Dutch figured out that if you uh, treat the raw chocolate or the, the roasted chocolate with uh, some, uh, I believe it's, so I'm not sure if it's uh, lye or if it's uh, lime, but you know it raises the pH of that uh, finished chocolate product, and it makes it richer and fuller. It it takes off that acrid, harsh edge, um, and the same thing happens with when brewing porters and stouts. So if you're any of the other stout styles. Yeah, you want alkalinity in your water because it is super nice for making a nice round beer. So if you're brewing with RO or uh, distilled water, would you treat your water for, you know, if you're gonna add your dark roast last, would you treat, how would you treat your water? Well, see the thing, so yeah, uh, Gordon Strong is a big proponent of, you know, adding the roast at the end of the uh, mash, you know, mash cap it and, and, and you get a, a softer and uh, or just sparging, uh, just sparging with yeah, it. Exactly. Uh, but the problem is you still end up with a lower than desirable wart overall wart pH and you lose some of the uh, uh, character uh, of those roast flavors, you know, they're, they're still coming through a little bit harsher and sharper than you might get if you had done it the right way. Those roasted uh, malts bring down pH, don't they, Martin? 
Y yes, indeed they do. So that's yeah, why you cool. need that alkalinity to, to help avoid uh, cratering the pH. So, um, so that question, you're, you're, you know, you want to add gypsum, calcium sulfate to your mash, not calcium chloride. Well, not, not necessarily. Um, you know, sulfate is, is a, has a drying effect on, on beer flavor and perception. So, you know, and so does roast. So if you have a lot of roast, you don't necessarily want a lot of sulfate in there. So, so don't go crazy with sulfate. Yeah, but if you're, uh, yeah, okay. I'll make All this right. point. My, my beer that just won last week, it was the Black Full was the target I did. And I added actually calcium chloride to, to just normal Lafayette water for that. So, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. What beer was that that you won? That you won? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I thought I was last how place. We, I'm sorry, forget, I misspoke. How did we forget to mention that Todd <laughs> won the heavy, heavy hydrometer? hydrometer. I, I'm sorry. I'm just looking at my recipe. I'm following well, through. Imperial so Stout. Out. <laughs> Fantastic beer. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. Hey, Todd, I'm holding, I'm holding this hostage. So ah. I, I get a bottle uh, of, of that winning beer. know what the symbolism <laughs> and every, how important this is. You guys get your name on it, Tom. I need uh, my, 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 my bottle point. of the winning beer to hand it over. <laughs> my point was it was basically Lafayette water with a little bit of calcium chloride. That's all. Yeah, all and I and, and that's the thing. Uh, you know that that <laughs> the alkalinity of our our natural Indiana waters uh, helps out when you're brewing those kind of beers. Um, and as a as an aside. You know, I was brought in by Upland to fix Bad Elmer because uh, uncharacteristically, Bloomington water out of Lake Monroe actually has relatively very low alkalinity. And they, you know, Upland was having a terrible problem. Uh, they couldn't get the, the pH of that wort high enough. And they were trying to use chalk, and, and of course, chalk doesn't work. Um, so I pointed them in the direction of lime, and, and you know, Bad, El Bad Elmer, uh, which now is named Good Martin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anytime you anytime you go in into Upland Tap Room, make sure you order a Good Martin. Yeah, no, that uh, this this story is true because that beer <laughs> went from. I don't know. I remember it good, but it was bad for a good 10 years plus, a decade. Yep. And, and now it's back to uh, a good, good range. Um, but that's, it's I, surface I water, right? Water so unlike, decade. unlike a lot of Indiana, they're, they're pulling water off the surface. Doesn't that have could be nearly only, limestone. The only answer because all the limestone around there, that's insane. All the limestone. Yeah. But the, the problem is that, that, you know, the, the water runs off the, the mountains, uh, around the reservoir and it and it doesn't have the the contact time with the limestone to gain the alkalinity so the the water in lake monroe is very low alkalinity interesting so it's a just it's a surface water lake is what you're saying yeah it's, yeah. it's more more like rainwater than you know our typical groundwater mm -hmm. i wish lake freeman was like that too but it's not <laughs> So anyhow, uh, I think that that's about it. Uh, let me let me stop sharing. There we well, go. I have a question for you, Martin. I, I'm yes, drinking sir. actually. I'm drinking an Upland Polar Bear Kisses, which is it's super flavored. So this is one that uses that surface water where they're adding a bunch of, I guess, salts to this to get the the pH or the the water profile down. Is that what you're saying? The, I I don't know. I don't know if they okay. do that. I'm assuming that they probably do. Okay. But that one doesn't have Martin in its name. Yeah. It says, I guarantee you uh, that it we says, will we'll never says, ever have a beer named Polar Bear Kisses. It says <laughs> Martin likes to kiss polar bears. I think that's what it says on the front right here. <laughs> uh, Ron, Ron, were you gonna? Ron, were you gonna do some stuff? Yeah, I can. Uh, someone make me. Uh, uh, co-host so I can share something or just uh, allow participants to share. Yeah. 
I'm going to go get a beer because I'm out. Yeah. I, I have got a, in a, a Sammy beer. Smith oatmeal stout. Before Ron mm -hmm. share, everybody grab a beer. Yeah, I'm going to grab a beer. Grab a beer. It's, I'm not going to talk that long. Uh, yeah, that would be a change. <laughs> You're not on mute, buddy. Come on. Oh, it would. Oh, it would. I tell. Well, while Martin was while Martin's gone, it sounded like he was trying to defend his uh, doctoral thesis with all the questions and challenges. It was it was fun to watch you guys. It it would be a change for me to not talk much, but I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, Ron, did you uh, judge Drunk Monk recently? Anyone on the call? No. Doing? Okay. I am hoping this uh, Sammy Smith oatmeal stout is as tasty as I remember it. Is uh, is not like drinking uh, green apple juice. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. And I don't detect that. Christmas, they get so much of seed out of hide. Hey, Charlie, this uh, fresh. This uh, well, this polar bear kiss has been much better on on imports though. Hopefully it's it's in better shape. All well, right, anyway, I, I just the, the uh, eight polar bear kisses is just beyond me. Yeah, it tastes like, like someone took some Andes mints and just melted them into a glass. So it tastes Ugh. like it. Yeah. It's it's pretty pretty uh, minty. No, uh, mint and beer. No, that's not that's no. No, I mean it, 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 there a lot of hops have some piney. And I've even tasted some hops that might even start to move a little bit toward mint and, and maybe, but minty beer, uh-uh. I saw somebody making a Girl Scout thin mint cookie. Yeah. Oh. This would this would this would meet that requirement, though. No, uh, I'm I, I'm sorry. It, it, everybody can drink whatever they want, but <laughs> where's that's Martin? Not me. Where's Mr. Martin? Are we waiting? Hey, Ron, are you getting, are you having a good turnout in terms of number of entries for uh, your Dehoosier round one or uh, Brown Meister? I have one? no idea. Okay, I didn't know if you just knew the number. Um, I don't check. I don't check the registration site. Okay. Uh, because I don't want to see any names or entry info. Uh, so Joe and Teresa uh, still have access to that and get me an update every once in a while, but I haven't seen one lately. And, you know, there's probably still people entering. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, Teresa, you or Joe, can you check, check that out and maybe let me know how many are registered? I will forward your request to the head steward. <laughs> All right. So Martin's back. This is actually his presentation. I just saw what it was on today and and said, oh, I've got a little information on that. This is actually a long presentation. This is for my IU class. Uh, so, so bear with some of the elementary stuff that's in there. But there is some interesting things in here about Guinness and nitrogen and those types of things. I take it everyone can see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, Don't be afraid. Okay, this is, uh, this is something interesting that roasted barley has that coffee flavor. You know, you, we got these three primary dark grains or malts that we use in making the darker beers. And during wartime, uh, roasted barley, which has the coffee-like flavor, during wartime in Germany, when they were cut off from the rest of the world and couldn't get coffee beans, they actually drank roasted barley like coffee. And uh, there's advertisements and stuff like that at the at the the factory. Obviously, it didn't have caffeine in it, but it tastes enough like coffee that. They, that's that's what the soldiers and people used uh, when they couldn't get actual coffee. It makes a great barley tea. Yeah, exactly. It's like coffee. Um, we'll skip these. 
the uh, the classic Irish stout. So we've talked about that. Talk a little bit about the uh, the nitrogen. Nitrogen is so important to to these beers. We didn't really talk about that. The story that I've heard on this is that the goal of using the nitrogen and the widget and all of that was to try to make a beer like you would get once they started shipping the beer around the world. Uh, the the question came up: How do we make this beer taste like it does here? And part of the thing that you would have to do, uh, beer tends to need you know a bit of a higher carbonation level to be stable in the package. But really, when you drink it, you want a lower uh, carbonation level, much more like what you would get off of a handful or, or something you know at the brewery. So the way to simulate that uh, was to use the nitrogen because nitrogen, unlike CO2, nitrogen does not want to stay in solution. Um, CO2 will stay in solution as long as the beer is cold. But once the beer warms up, even CO2 has a tendency to gush out, right? You ever open a warm beer? and it gushes out, that's CO2 saying, I don't want to be here, but as long as the beer is nice and cold or chilled, the CO2 will stay in there. Nitrogen, on the other hand, does really not want to stay in solution at all, which is why we use nitrogen blends when we're pushing beer a very long distance. Um, long draw draft systems, when you're pushing beer you know, 200 feet, and upstairs or something like that, you can't just crank up the CO2 pressure that would overcarbonate the beer. So you use a blend of nitrogen and CO2 so you can crank up the pressure, push the beer a long way, but not overcarbonate the beer. So nitrogen blends are very common for doing that. And this was sort of the whole concept, some nice pictures there of the, the hand pull at uh, uh, Broad Ripple Brew Pub. For those that haven't been in there in a while, go have one of those hand pull beers. What, what was that mountain? This mountain? <laughs> yes. This, this, is, this is the mountain that says, we don't need lots of CO2. We don't need to be bloated when we're drinking beer. It's more enjoyable to drink beer when you've released some of that CO2. Nice. It, it, it helps with packaging and, and stability, but once we're drinking it, we, we really don't want that. So lowering the CO2 level is a big part of what this whole thing is about. So the widget right here, if you cut a can open or, right, everyone's probably cut a can open and you got the, the ball in there. And the ball contains some nitrogen and a pinhole. And the nitrogen is held back by the pressure of the CO2 and the beer that surrounds it. But when you open it, that releases some of that pressure enough that the CO2 comes gushing out. And you want it to gush out. You really want to agitate that CO2. And then once you start agitating that CO2, it will start trying to get out of the beer, basically. Here's a diagram. Uh, as the, the nitrogen is kind of activated, um, it's making a beeline for the top of the vessel. And as it's making that, that beeline for the top of the vessel and trying to get out of solution, it's grabbing CO2 molecules and taking them along for the ride. So that by the time you've you've been patient and waited for this proper pour, uh, basically what's happened with the nitrogen is you've, you've scrubbed off a lot of CO2 and made this a nicer drinking cask type uh, ale as opposed to the highly carbonated beer that it was in the can. Hey, Ron. Yeah. Uh, so at a proper Guinness uh, dispensary, uh, you know, they, they have the special uh, faucet and all that sparkler. That kegged beer 
is that solely on CO2 or is there also nitrogen in the, their kegs? Oh uh, man, that's a good question. I've always, I've always assumed that those were just straight CO2 and okay. that the nitrogen was going to be applied in the special pouring technique. Okay. Because yeah, they s sparkle it or whatever. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a video in this presentation. I, oh. I won't show it, but somewhere here. There's a nice, uh, nice diagram of the, the nitrogen pour. Over here, you're getting all that agitation and that, that weird downward waterfall. And if you pour this too gingerly, or you if, you if you open this, if you open this can and let it sit too long and then pour, and or pour too gingerly, you lose the entire effect. You lose the whole thing. You have to pour it while that while that nitrogen is actively in there. And you want to rouse it up in there and agitate the shit out of it, and and really create that image uh, that's on the left side there. If you don't get that, uh, you you basically lost a lot of the effect of the nitrogen and the whole point of it being there. Mm -hmm. So agitate it, make your glass look like this, then be patient patient, patient, give it a couple of minutes so that it will finally clear. And when it finally clears and it's perfectly black like that, and you got that nice creamy head on top, that's, that's when your beer is ready to drink and you have, you've expressed out some of that CO2 and you've got a nicer cask-like ale sitting in front of you. Uh, this is, this is interesting. They're, is no widget in uh, the bottles of nitro, of left hand nitro stout. It's a great beer, but there's no widget. And there is a little bit of, of uh, nitrogen in there, but there's no widget to create the agitation. So if you ever buy one of these, you'll read on the label, it says pour with a heavy hand. You have to create your own agitation. The first time I had one of these, I did not read the instructions. I poured it like a normal beer. I did not get any of the waterfall sensation. It was very dull. And uh, then I'm like, well, that was a dud. And then I start looking at the, the bottle and I read where it says pour with a heavy hand. It's like, ah, I got to create the agitation myself because there's no widget. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So without a widget, without a widget, but you still have the nitrogen, create that agitation yourself, pour the shit out of it, agitate the shit out of it, and, and get it to activate so that it starts trying to make its way out of the beer and grabbing those CO2 molecules and, and taking them along, as I said before, for the ride. Uh, this is interesting. We, we talk about, uh, well, one of the things I mentioned was how light Guinness actually is um, when it really comes right down to it. And the, the classic black and tan sort of uh, exemplifies that because you would think the dark beer would be the heavy one and the one that would sink to the bottom. But, you know, the whole black and tan or blacksmith, which is a, a, a Smittic's red ale on the bottom, it's, it keeps that separation because the Guinness is indeed lighter, right? So it, it doesn't sink down through there and it will stay separated. Um, what's that place in Ta Chatham Tap? Uh, not yeah. too many places do good black and tans anymore. And Chatham Tap, I think they closed, didn't they? No, 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 no. Uh, Mc, uh, McNiven. Yeah. Anyway, there's 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 a wonderful beauty in in drinking a a uh, a well poured black and tan. You got to use the the upside down spoon and and that whole thing to to pour it in there softly so that it doesn't get mixed up. If you haven't had one of these ever, um, it's it's a real kind of historic treat to have. 
and yeah that chatham has a whole list of different beers you can mix with you can have a half and half with guinness and yeah yeah so uh the milk stout <laughs> we have a black and tan turtle the the black milk stout tan. there's a big rumor there oh. was a big rumor for for decades 100 years or something that uh, milk stouts and beer in general were very healthy beverages for pregnant and lactating women. Uh, this was even a, an advertisement saying, drink beer. It's much healthier for you and the baby. You definitely don't want to drink this light beer or water or whatever this is. Uh, look how look how pathetic she looks and how pathetic that baby is. Whereas over here, you got the woman drinking beer and she looks healthy and the baby's healthy. So due to, due to this myth of um, beer and especially milk stouts being healthy beverages, they, uh, they have, I don't, think, I don't know if it's a law, but they have tried to get people to stop calling beer milk stouts and cream stouts in, in uh, Europe, uh, especially in England, and, and trying to get people to refer to them as sweet stouts because referring to them as milk stouts and cream stouts was continuing this myth that they were trying to squash and it even it even, uh, it even came over here this is an old ad for blatz and uh again talking about the healthy benefits mm -hmm. of of drinking beer ah there's that american stout Anyway, I think that's it. That's all uh, I I had that I thought was applicable to tonight's. Thank you, Ron. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So any discussions on uh, particular beers that you have? Ron, I'd say that uh, you are correct for the oatmeal, Sammy Smith uh, oatmeal stout. Yeah, there is a hint of... Uh, uh, a seed of a seed little, little green apple. There's there there's like I think it's just part of their process. There's always a little green apple. Yep. But man, when it oxidizes, ethanol that ethanol reverts back. It goes back in the opposite direction, and uh, it will as as it oxidizes, it will it will turn into a total green apple bomb. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because every Sam Smith I get that out of over here. Yeah. I've never had one in the UK though, but now I need to make that, you know, a priority to maybe, maybe it's better condition and not nearly as bad. I always assumed it was. Didn't help that my uh, Sammy Smith bottles were at, you know, 40 degrees. It probably need to be a good 10 degrees warmer. They, they, do, have, they do have two glassware though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Samuel Smith, the last one I got, I was so disappointed in the way it tasted. And then I read the bottle and their date codes are all coded. You can find out, but it's like ZRQF, you know. So if you learn the codes, maybe you can get a fresher one. But this one was six months or whatever. Uh, they're, they're hard. No good. So, so I got some this year. Actually, uh, Belinda got some. Um, she's trained well or something but she came back uh from meyer with the after christmas like variety pack that includes a glass so she's done that for several the last few years yeah. come back with the, like the i don't know eight dollar four packs plus a glass mm -hmm. it's good it's a good gig buy your buy your samuel smiths in january after christmas my sammy smith came from How's your Sammy Smith, Jeff? We haven't heard from you tonight. Yeah, what do you got there, Jeff? I actually have the uh, organic chocolate stout. So, oh, and, and there's there's a that's there's a, a good one. one. Yeah, it's it's pretty damn good. It's I, if there's any green apple, the chocolate's covering it up. <laughs> no, I, there's something about those beers. I think they sell them so dang fast. Um, they they they're not shelf turds. Um, it's hard to find sometimes that beer is so good. 
and I've I've had a few of them, and uh, I haven't gotten green apple off of those guys. But yeah, it's pretty it's pretty uh, pretty tasty. Probably by far my favorite uh, Sandy Smith that I've Dad? I've had of theirs by by a long shot. Yeah. Now I'm gonna have to seek it out. They had it. They did have it at Total Wine. I don't know if they still do or not. Okay. But that's where I found mine. Oh, nice. But oh, I was cool. at Total Wine today looking at the stouts. I didn't notice the Sam Smith's there in that, you know, where the single beer uh, area is where the stouts, they've only got like three shelves of stouts, and some of those are actually porters. So this, was it was over in the. It was with like all the English beers. It was it was kind of in that section, I guess, probably like the third aisle or something like that. There's like a little section of all English beers, and it was in with them. Well, well, well now we're we're uh, de delving into. So it's called a uh, chocolate stout, but um, you know that that's you're bordering into porter, aren't you? Uh, it's got it's got actual chocolate in it, if I re recall. Okay. Yeah, it's got it uses like chocolate malt, and then it has cocoa, organic cocoa. Yeah, um, it's got real but, real chocolate in it. Cocoa. But Ron, am am I correct in this in uh, stating that a, a good stout always has at least a hint of that that almost burnt or burnt roast malt character? To, to me, it's the differentiator between stouts and porters. Um, porters. You know, there's a lot of the middle, the middle ground that's going to have both the coffee character of roasted barley, uh, some of the burnt notes of black malt, um, and then some of the cocoa flavors of chocolate malt, right? You've got to have all of those in, in kind of all those porters and stouts, but the porters should or usually do tend to lean more towards that chocolate malt and the cocoa. And the stouts are going to lean just a little bit more towards that black malt and roasted barley and just a little more coffee like but there's there's some real there's some real tweeners in there but that's usually how I differentiate them is porters tend to be more cocoa -y and stouts tend to be more more coffee like. But you know sometimes you get a an extra stout and a and a uh, American porter, what we used to call robust porter, and sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. It's a fine line. Yeah, I'm not so sure. So I know you guys are missing out by the virtual meeting because this uh, uh, Irish extra I brewed is freaking delicious. <laughs> You're right. We are missing That's out. It's out. Sounds like maybe, maybe we can do this in person sometime. Gathering soon. Yeah, I I believe we are close. Damn it, we're very yeah, close. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh, please we're close. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the Volks March. Yeah, we're meeting yeah. We're meeting on the 13th, right? So yeah. we're out. So next yeah. next weekend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah still got to be safe. Please, everybody uh, safe. participate. Yeah. They can. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Just a reminder, though, everybody be safe on that one. We're, we're, we're not out of this yet. We are not Texas. No. <laughs> no. Sure we What's are. so weird about I'm that is, you know, but we, I, I, we I think the point is, is that we can, businesses can operate. We just need to wear masks. Wear the freaking mask. Yeah, it's simple. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree. We are the final four. If we can do it for the final four, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, we're in the freaking mask and have I, fun, damn it. I, I have not eaten all day, so I'm going to get out of here. Mark, that was a really uh, great presentation. Really enjoyed the history and the uh, the water profiles and something more in depth than, than just the basic, you know, uh, here's here's the beer style. I think that that really added a wonderful level of of uh, deeper understanding to those styles. Thank heard. you, sir. And, and remember, or, order your good Martin. <laughs> uh, no, nice. Fifteen entries so far. Fifteen. Fifteen. That's what I said. Yep. All right. Well, pretty good. So, and we might get a few more. Or 
a few less, but that's that's pretty good. Fifteen. I have a I have a car load I'm bringing down from Lafayette on Friday mornings. So fantastic. And I have a couple of pro brewers I got signed up to, so we'll see how they turn out. So. Fantastic. Good. All right. Well, guys, I'm gonna go. That's a good presentation. Good to see everybody. Good. Good. Oh. Good. Hey, thanks. We're thanks, Ron. Yep. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Hey, Dana. I get it. I, I'm in good sale, I, uh, <laughs> Martin. <laughs> He's gone. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Martin. <laughs> there you are. You're actually, you show him a picture he missed. That's too bad. <laughs> I just figured this out. Like, and, and this bar is actually unique. It's called the Spaniard, and they had Beamish and Murphy's, which is, you know, uh, usually tied houses. So you can't, for some reason, the, the uh, Beamish or the Murphy sign is cut off, but whatever. It's the best I could do on sports. Does Ron have a trip there too? I know Ron has a Belgian trip and a, a German oh, yeah. trip. Nope, not yet. Do you have a trip to Ireland? Right. Ireland no. Okay, no. Yeah, the, the trip you want is uh, Jake's in my trip to uh, Cider Country coming up uh, 2025. Nice. Where's this going to be? There is a person who does cider trips. Uh, she does a podcast called Cider Cider Chat, I think. Yeah. Hey, 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 don't be giving away all our business. <laughs> no, she, she, I forget her name, too, but she, uh, I followed a lot of what she did when the family and I went over there two falls ago, and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic, underappreciated uh, area with lots of good alcoholic beverages that aren't beer, but still good. Is cider an English thing? I, I don't even know the history. English and French and... Anywhere there's happen. a lot of history, but English and French are the main ones. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I've been texting with Jake. I'm doing a cider right now for the first time, I think, ever with some crazy new. Is it fermentous yeast? I got yeah. What kind of uh, fermentus? There's four new fermentus yeast they have. Um, I have a whole list. There's a for sure you can look at the fermentus site. I'm using the Tutti Fruity. Has a little bit of residual sweetness in it, so. We'll see how it turns they're, out with some local cider. So they're not available until oh, like yeah. July in America, though. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, not on this call, but most calls I ask like an inordinate amount of questions, and so the guys at Fermenta sent me a whole care package of these yeasts. So I got two of each of. Uh, there's those crisp ones, there's sweet ones, and they're they're more than just a general one they have. So they have a couple. They're they're distributing first in like 500 gram bricks, but. They have little consumer sizes that are five grams that I have. So, nice. I have so if you, you got a 500 that. gram brick, you need to uh, share. Yeah, yeah, I haven't done that yet. I I have five grams. I'm I'm doing a five gallon batch right now with uh, one called Tutti Fruity, and I don't know. I sent a copy to you, Jake, or what it is, but it's got some texture. Yeah, the, the French cider, as I understand it, it's it's a lot of process. I mean, they really nutrient starve the um, the juice. So, yeah, there's a whole process called keying, which yeah. is fascinating. But yeah, it, you basically cut leave it, it remains sweet because you've taken all the nutrients out and the yeast are like, I'm done. Yeah, and there's this like thick hard cap at the top and you like have to puncture it and then siphon out the cider. It's crazy, but that's um, so odd. And and there's also all the perries over there, especially mm -hmm. in the south of Normandy, it's tons of perries. And all this stuff is incredibly cheap. You're buying, you're buying a whole bottle filled with delicious beverages for like the price of the bottle of an empty bottle here. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like three three euros or three three point three euros. You know, it's a little more than the bottle. But uh, and we were just driving around. I was knocking on these like doors. You know, you just drive up to a farmhouse that had some little sign, or you found out about <laughs> knock on the doors. And they're like, oh, you want cider? And they'll <laughs> come out to the, meet you out in the barn, sell you some cider. It was pretty cool. Wow. That's very cool. That's awesome. Hey, uh, excuse and me. It, and so I, is Andrew still on here? Yeah, maybe maybe uh, we need a CIA on cider. I can, like, I don't, between Jake and I, we could probably throw something together. Okay, you guys. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I have a port announcement. <laughs> Jeff Jennings. Just what won the uh, gift card for the night. Ooh, All right, thank you. All right, Jeff. 
Lottery winner. Or Prime Evil. Grand Junction. Unmute. Unmute. <laughs> yeah, who's taking care of it? Joe? Or, no, that's, that's Eric? Un, no, Eric. I'm doing it. Eric's doing it. So far, it's, it's right now it's Prime Evil. Good stuff. That's great stuff. I need to get back there. Haven't been there for a while. Two beers. It just tapped the Saison yesterday. So can I bring up when do people think we would be comfortable starting pub nights again? I mean, if everyone's vaccinated, I mean, it sounds like all of you guys are going to be vaccinated within like a month or two. Also, yeah, I mean, are. for those of you under 18, uh, Jake, you know, you might have to. <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, yeah, when you start to grow hair in your face, <laughs> oh. you can organize them and just like not go if you. By the time you get vaccinated, it will be ready. <laughs> right. Hey, I think we're going to combine pub nights and the uh, weekend. You know, like the Volks March thing. You know, it's kind of a combination. And as long as the weather's nice, we can meet outside. Yeah. yeah. So many of the pubs have. Uh, outdoor seating too so i mean i think most people are comfortable with that yeah but getting a big group of people who don't get together together even outdoors is still kind of yeah. iffy yeah right i mean if you're all vaccinated obviously that's one thing but well i feel safe on the weekends you know uh, i know that we don't all all get together uh, but you know being outside and, and we're wearing a mask and um, you know double mask makes you feel more comfortable but um, so starting back up is that what I'm hearing well, what do you well with, with, with spring with spring yeah. coming I would say <clears throat> if you set them up outside that might be uh, not everybody will be comfortable but uh, it might be might be worthwhile while the good weather's good. Oh, yeah. I mean, you could, it wouldn't be too much different than the Volks March in some way if we can find an outside spot. Right. Just throw it out there, you know, if you want to set something up, um, schedule an event, create an event or something. All right. There's definitely some uh, new breweries I've been looking at that we haven't been to yet. So, what? Well, have we been to Moon Town? No, not for pub nights at least. Jake won't know, come this far north. Yeah, I know they didn't they win uh, with the Great American <laughs> Beer Festival. If they have an outdoor seating area, maybe that's uh, doable. No, they, they, they do. They do. We could probably reserve it all um, because it'd be about our size uh, as a group. Probably it might be worth a contact. And I don't have a budget, it. so. <laughs> <laughs> But you could probably guarantee, you could personally guarantee so much consumption. <laughs> I ain't personally guaranteeing <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh, Funny. Hey. Well, you, just, you just put it out there, Jake. You know, you put it out there. Uh, see who might be interested. Uh, create an event, you know, and see if you get the type of of participation that you know you think it makes makes it worthwhile and we just go from there um, oh, I've done a night where I'm the only person that shows up so that's worthwhile to me uh. <laughs> you have to invite us Jake oh we can't come to your house if you don't invite us <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's funny no yeah pick a date you know set something up if, if you're Anxious to do that, and we'll uh, I'll probably wait a little bit at least until late April, early May, maybe. I don't know. Don't I'm really ask. curious who on the call right now has gotten their first jab or is fully vaccinated. I'm bad both times. Monday. Tomorrow count. Monday. Get it tomorrow. And uh, I got eight days until I get mine. April okay, so we, we got April about 3rd. six weeks and everyone's vaccinated, but Jake, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so go ahead and coordinate it, Jake, and we'll go to the party and we'll Jake, tell you. As soon as you get the shot, 
Yeah. Or wait, you can't get us to you know, buy the beer and brings it to my house and leaves it on the front porch. Well, Jake's the only one who hasn't had a vaccine, then he can't get it from us and we can't give it to exactly. him. Exactly. I think that's great. You come too, Jake. <laughs> hey, herd immunity. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hey, can I can I share my new uh, my new future mash ton? Man, I love I love beer stuff. Please, let me see if it'll work. Hey, Jeff, can you, you see there? It? Holy yeah. moly! Hey, check your email. I just sent you a uh, gift card or <laughs> gift number. Mr. Hey, so this is, uh, I, I picked this off at eBay for a hundred bucks shipped, and uh, wow. let's say um, Das right. Sparks Keg. Das plus keg. Is it Schaefer. plastic? Well, um, it's plastic. What? I got um, it. It's steel. Cool. It's plastic in case. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It's like it's like high uh, high quality keg. So I'm gonna flip it upside down. Make the make the top the drain port. Yeah. And cut off the bottom. Um, I got the. I had to get that. It's a Sankey. Yeah, I see. Um, I think yeah. S spear, which was slightly annoying because it has unlike the U.S. kegs. It has safety features so that when you take the spear out, it doesn't shoot you in the face if yeah. it takes your pressure and kill you. Um, so. <laughs> probably a good feature in, in Europe, yeah. Probably. Yeah, yeah, but in America, like uh, killing birds here in America, though. In America, we're all about you know land of the free. We don't need all those regulations. Yeah, um, crap. So anyway, I'm playing around with that. That's arrived at UBS today. Looks pretty good so shape. Yeah. It was like sixty bucks plus shipping, and it supposedly was used in a uh, water treatment plant to hold water. They said <laughs> uranium rich enriched water. Maybe I didn't figure that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm it just looked kidding. like practically brand new. So anyway, I'm excited. Anybody have any tips for uh, cutting the bottom off of this thing? Uh, I I don't have a plasma cutter, nor I'm not sure if I'd want to use one on this. So I'm thinking water jet, but I don't think you have access to that, do you? Yeah, I don't. I'm thinking sawzall. Yeah. I'm gonna try to get it as wide as possible so I can get as big a mash cap in there as possible. You know, grind grinders, angle grinders seem to work the best. Yeah. Otherwise, the sawzalls, you'll, you'll yeah. I have jacked up so many blades doing that. Yeah, I'm thinking uh, angle grinder, maybe three inch blade instead of four and a half inch blade, and hey, there you go. Hey, Tom, forever, supposedly. Uh, I'm looking into distilling. So I know you're thinking about distilling stuff. Stuff. Uh, right. Essential oils. Um, exactly. Water. So I'm trying to find the right system. So we can talk. We need to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I assume on this, you put a boil coil and it's all electric. Obviously, you're not going to heat this, right? Use the plastic as insulation. Yeah, it's the plastic supposedly will supply some insulation. I'm going to do a rims. I've done all kinds of like things, not rims, but I'm going old school. So it's basically rims, which I would say is old school, plus a keg, which is old school. So it's like old school setup. Nice. So what's going to happen to your old mash ton? Oh, it'll, I don't know. Only if this one works. <laughs> I, I'm an equipment uh, whore. So, you know, I, I will try 10 things. <laughs> As soon as it works, I'll change it up. Hoarder so. or whore? Is that a hoarder? Hoarder? All, all of those. How do I unshare? I can't figure this out. Um, it should be at the bottom someplace, I think. We get to look uh, at your computer for the rest of our. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, no, I can't do it. Figured out how to share. You can't figure out how to unshare. Yeah, I don't. Know. There you go. Nice. Early in the pandemic, I got into distilling. So this is 170 proof. Holy oh, crap. Oh. That's AK moonshine, huh? Nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I got it. I made some uh, sanitizer. I want to see you take a sip, Lee. Yeah, drink a sip right now in front of us. <laughs> uh, so I had some uh, beer that. Uh, I tried and it didn't really work out, so I just put it into the still, and the, it was nice. three passes of distilling uh, to get it to 170 proof. Dang, nice! So, but it was fun learning all about that and how it uh, how it works. You need to do another heavy hydrometer at your house. Well, that no, you have to get a. Uh, I mean, I got a uh, uh, 
the other type of hydrometer, whatever the hydrometer is, it measures uh, proof. And uh, so it's, but uh, uh, Pico Brew has a Pico Still, which I have. Uh, so <laughs> played around with it. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> so, so Lee, have you tried to barrel age that or, or wood age it anyway? No, what next thing I want to do is I want to actually make a mash that is aimed more at gotcha. something that we would recognize this. I mean, this is uh, alcohol. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, just yeah. Pure, it's pure ethanol. I mean, it's uh, you open the lid and take a whiff and whoa. It's, uh, I mixed it with a little bit of glycerin and hydrogen peroxide to uh, soften it. So it ended up being about 75% alcohol in the uh, uh, the hand sanitizer that resulted from it. Right. It did well in a barrel. Said? It would do barrel. It would do well in a barrel. Yeah, it may be that I could just put this in and see what it uh, uh, did. I mean, it'd be a pretty small little barrel. Yeah. I got a, I got a ten gallon barrel, but I don't have. This is all I got. <laughs> it's a lot of beer to spill down. Yeah. I mean, you could throw some oak, oak chips in there. That'd be that would work. Oh yeah, oh, there you go. Hey, uh, um, so as I've said before, I'm a fan of putting the wood in the uh, liquid, not the liquid in the wood. But Lee, I do have, uh, as I've mentioned before, for beer, I took I bought a whole uh, bourbon barrel and dismantled it. So I've got staves, uh, which is quarter sawn oak. Um, so if you were you. You're welcome to a, a stave if you want to uh, do something with that. You could always rechar it, do all, anything, whatever. Cool. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. I have a few staves that my uh, son-in-law got me. Uh, I haven't done anything with. I need to try those and some things too. Just to, uh, uh, but yeah, it'd be interesting to take some of this. And, I mean, even even this is hardly enough to put a stave in. Yeah, just a you know couple four inch pieces you know. pieces yeah cut up some pieces and, and put them in and see what it does no i i've aged uh i have a friend who uh has done some distilling that uh i you know i acquired some stuff and uh put some put some staves in it my brother is make it it's so different than brewing beer and trying to manage the pressure and the temperature and everything to get it to still maintain distilling and stuff. Excellent. In the last pass of the distilling, I actually added uh, RO water to my to what I was because I needed to up the volume in order to be able to then distill out to get the percentage you know, get uh, hit the target that I was aiming for. So you dilute it down just so you can make it uh, stronger. And changing subjects, but Andrew Cordy is here at CIA next week. Andrew Cordy. I think he's frozen. Maybe he's not. What? CIA oh, what? next week. There is CIA next week. Yes. Cool, cool shit. With John yeah, Allison. Your marketing, your marketing is great. <laughs> I love that cool shit. That was awesome. So it's coming up next week. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Facebook. Email. Should we should we join it? Is it going to be all gonna the stop? data? I mean, I, do you want, I can recite the Zoom URL to you, character by character, if you if you wish. That would be better on my end than what you've been doing today. Pardon? <laughs> that would be better marketing than what you've done so far in this meeting. <laughs> okay, uh, we did talk about it. I mean, Dan uh, mentioned it, so I'm just giving a hard time. You're late. I must have joined late, or I stepped away. Maybe that was during the beer break. No. Will that be recorded? So if we can't see it, we could watch it afterwards. It will indeed, and be posted to our YouTube channel. Oh, cool. yes. But just make sure that somebody says something. I forgot to give. Uh, yeah. Uh, John permission to record tonight, so we started a little late, and I would prefer not to cut off the meeting. So um, just make sure to remind me to, you know, give somebody else permission or 
whatever. I've got a reminder set to yeah to to remind somebody. Hey, um, Jeff, are you gonna judge uh, the Braumeister with with John with uh, Ron, or is it somebody else? Uh, it, it's gonna have to be somebody else. I'm gonna be out of town the next couple weekends, so because it's the judging's next weekend, isn't it? It is, I yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to brag on Kent a little bit. Before Kent moved, like two weeks ago, he brought his his uh, Braumeister beers for submission to me to submit for him. So I have let him sit outside for like a week or two in the sun. So he. Has no <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just kidding. They've been in the freezer, or refrigerator the whole time. So. Yeah, they just, they just now have your label on them instead of a. Yeah, yeah I, I, he he gave me two to try, and I'm like, what if it's in mine? And I better turn them in as my name. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I hope you win, buddy. <laughs> I wouldn't have mentioned it, uh, Jeff, if you were judging. That's why I said that. So. Now I probably screwed it up because I bet I bet Tom's judging, so now I'm in trouble. So sorry. No, but we're we're recording it. So oh wait, oh I didn't realize you're recording it. <laughs> Ron's not going to watch back and see us talk to each other. Probably not. <laughs> How many views do you get on those videos? I don't know for sure. John, do you have any uh, idea how many hits we get on these videos? Oh, at least a handful. That's cool. <laughs> I hate a handful. <laughs> like five. That's good. Let's keep Maybe not that many, but yeah. That's not going to give us any advertising clout. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can hire people to watch them, right? <laughs> They're going to be some mistake clicks up to five, I think. Oh, wait, wait. I need to click that. that. That's pro that's probably more the uh replies than I get to my emails. So you know, hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> Do we have any really thumbs down ratings on the on those videos? <laughs> Are they all likes? Yeah, I don't think anybody's rated them at all. <laughs> Well, I need to do. I need to do my duty. I'll get in there and start giving some likes, whatever. You should. You should write some comments about whether the information's accurate or not. That would be funny. Yeah, right. We need to get in there. <laughs> Everybody here, get in there and start commenting and stuff. I disagree with you, Martin. I think the water profile should be X, Y, and Z. <laughs> <laughs> I think there should be a prize for who gets the best feedback. Or who gives the best feedback? There you go. Think... You might give a gift card <laughs> for the best comment, right? Who has the most questions during their presentation? They get like the Timex award or something. You know? Who can throw the best shade at people online? Hmm. <laughs> I think the, the technical content in this group is fantastic. I mean, what was presented tonight was awesome both sides so i love a copy of what martin did because i was looking while he was presenting to brewing water i'm like hey i paid for this brewing water i don't have any of this cool information here about the ground water versus the, the chalk water but hey i just yeah, and then he said where you get the chart and he's like it's mine exactly it's, <laughs> it's in my pocket <laughs> no like he created um, i think he might have had some uh HA Brewers Publications help on that graphic. That was, I think he did too. I think you're right. Was, was it just me or did it look like the bottom of that one chart looked like a uh, like a crumpled up paper bag? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and I think it was. <laughs> it was funny. a paper bag. It was awesome though. It was well done. It was like claymation. That's what London, the bedrock looks like. First. <laughs> Needed some animation. Would have been awesome. I like the maps, though. It gives you a better reference point, you know, of, of mm -hmm. what you're talking about, the area and lo location. Yeah. I got my vaccine card, and I thought, this is going to help me get on the airplane to Europe, and what this is going to help me do, you know, go over to some of those cool places you see in these uh, discussions. So I'm uh, way behind you, Tom, and Andrew, and others to 
any of these locations in Europe, and I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah, traveling again is going to be a good thing. Hopefully, hopefully that's in our futures. Yeah. Agreed. 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 I'm out. Good seas. Thank you. Good night. Okay. okay. It was great. Thanks, guys. All right. Signing Good night. off. Night, everybody. Bye.